All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Mark and Jen Stein. We're at the Nicholson Library at Linfield College. It's January 29th, 2020. Thank you both for joining us today. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. having us. Uh, let's start with the most important question. Sure. Why wine? <laughs> it's a loaded question, I think. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, I, you know, I think um, we've often talked about the fact that there's a cliche that you've probably heard from people in the seat before that wine finds you and you don't necessarily find wine. Um, you know, Jen can, you know, we, we had such divergent, I mean, backgrounds that were so different that came together over yeah. wine. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, employed in, uh, in the commercial real estate industry and, um, had been working on deals for a couple of years and got a gift from, uh, the CEO of the company that I worked for, for, Christmas basically as a thank you for working on a gift for two years and late one night the week of Christmas and uh, New Year's my friend and I opened a bottle of wine and it just kind of flipped me out I had never really considered a path in wine before I was national director of real estate for a developer in Michigan and uh, you know I I just wine just hit me it just grabbed me and yeah. then Fast forward to finding her and her background. Yeah, I mean, I had been in hospitality for ever since I can remember, um, all through college. After college, got back into it. Opened a private island and worked with some really exclusive people and things. And, you know, I got to experience some really great situations. And then, you know, life happened and I ended up working at the Breakers in Palm Beach, where is where I really found my footing with wine. So, working in the restaurants there, we had to take a wine course. And that course was taught by a master som. Mm -hmm. And Virginia was fantastic. It was once a week, every week, different regions. And I was like, this is fascinating. This is absolutely fascinating. You know, she started to talk about how it's involved in religion and geology and biology, all these different things, which work, just working in restaurants, you never really know that. You're just like, oh, it's Chardonnay. It's, you know, it's whatever, right? You're just pouring it and it's fine. But once you start to figure out that there's so much more to it, and it's so interesting and it's changing all the time, I think that's where it really started for me. Um, and then soon after that, we met. Yeah, so I, I you know, I kind of fell in love with wine and threw my entire world up in the air and moved down to Florida and wanted to, my connection with wine was through restaurants also. And, you know, I grew up working in restaurants and you know, the history of it at the table with your family and you know, it, there was just, and we, and we talk about a lot about this and when we're training service staff and talking to servers that wine and food is, it's so much about what you had as a child. And mm -hmm. Someone walks into your restaurant or walks into your winery, they're, they're connecting a whole lot of things under the surface that you don't necessarily think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, I kind of picked up my entire life, moved to Florida because my connection was with restaurants and I had a great in with a wine focused restaurant in Palm Beach. And then one day we met. <laughs> that happy hour at a you know bar on the, be on the beach. Of course. And, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, and that's how it goes. Really, the first conversations were all about wine. Mm -hmm. And then the second conversation was... What's for dinner? What's for dinner? <laughs> and, it, and it was more about... What, what wine, wine are we're we going to have with dinner? What are we going to have and what are we going to make with the wine? And that was the first date. And then on the first date, we talked about, well, where do you want to be in life? Mm -hmm. Where do you want... Where, where's the next stop you want to be? We were both in South Florida. Neither one of us were... Thrilled. Wanted to be there for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And we both said Colorado. And it was, again, second conversation, first date. So we started dating. A year later, we took a road trip to Colorado mm -hmm. and fell in love. We thought we were going to move to Denver. We ended up moving to Aspen. Again, following wine and food, we connected with a, a, a great chef out there. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, you know, if you show up in Colorado, I, I'll give you a job. And so we went to Colorado. <laughs> yeah, that's what we did. And um, from there, I mean, our love for wine just kind of grew. Yeah. Well, and then I. You Mark know, I mean, started. People, Mark hear, did, yeah. people hear, oh, you went to Colorado for wine. 
But we went to Aspen and Aspen has this just incredible scene of, scene is probably not the right word, community is probably the better word, at the time of um, certified sommeliers, Master. advanced sommeliers, and the most masters mm -hmm. in the world in a small in one area. Sp in one spot. And the community and the ability to learn wine there is unparalleled. And there's two distinct off seasons, and so you find that the best wine minds in the world show up there every year at certain points. If it's the Food and Wine Festival, mm -hmm. if it's the Master Sommelier Test in May, whatever it is, and and your guests, the people that are populating the restaurants, have some of the best wine cellars in the world, mm -hmm. and they want to open it with the people that are studying and are working, and so you have access to taste these wines that you don't have anywhere <laughs> You're else. You're never going to get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in, in Colorado was where I took the test, my second test in the Court of Master Sommelier to become a certified, um, and was running a great wine program, but never felt like... Well, I think then you went to Pinot Camp, and then, yeah, that's what happened. Then he came to Pinot Camp, and then he was like, ooh, this is really cool. But I don't think he really, like, I think that made him realize that he needed to learn more about wine. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, I don't know, it was probably six months later, maybe eight months later, he was like, I think I'm going to quit my job and go work harvest. And I was like, uh, come again? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how it went. We had been married for about six, six months. Six months. We were married. He's like, I'm just going to quit. I'm just leave me in Colorado. I was like, okay, cool. Well, I don't think it was. Quite <laughs> no, it wasn't that. quite like that. <laughs> but no, it made I me think. Sweat now. Yeah, no. But, um, I think more, I was like, okay, you go. I'll stay here and hold down the fort. We'll see how this goes. Yeah, and, but that was driven right. for both of us, for sure. I think, for by sure. more of a need. We, we never felt like Aspen was going to be our final stop. It wasn't the real world. We were never going to afford the house that we wanted to buy. If we ever wanted to start a wine project, project we weren't going to be able to do that and live in Aspen, even with some of the only full-time year-round jobs that existed there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. we came out for Pinot Camp and just so much about the Northwest connected with what we loved about Colorado. Yeah. Well, and I think also your wine list was really geared towards wines at the Pacific Northwest, which is, you know, like part of the reason why we ended up here. You know, maybe not here in the Willamette, just the Pacific Northwest in general. Like he really had an affection for a lot of the producers out here. And so we started to drink a lot of wine that was well, in I, the, from this region. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, and I think that comes across with what results in our wine bottle. Yeah. Um, the things that we fell in love with were Willamette Valley Chardonnay mm -hmm. and Syrah from Walla Walla. And we, we kind of thought about, okay, here's Walla Walla, here's Portland, the Willamette Valley, and for us it made more sense to be here. Mm -hmm. um, and when we were, we, it made more sense to be here and our love of Syrah and not Pinot Noir. We also love Pinot Noir, so I should <laughs> yeah, right. But um, we felt gave us kind of a, a good place to be in this area and not trying to, you know, battle everybody and their neighbor to buy Pinot grapes and mm -hmm. make Pinot Noir. Uh, we thought that it, it's, it's our love and we love being here as opposed to Wall wall. Wall. Mm -hmm. so. It's a little remote. Mm -hmm. We already lived remote for five years, so we needed a little more city life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm curious, you, you both came into wine uh, from the kind of consumer slash uh, uh, hospitality side. I'm curious about your educational process. You mentioned the early psalm classes and, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, and learning wine that way. At what point does it become something you think you want to do like for the rest of your life or do as a, like a career? Well, I mean, I, I ended up, I did take my intro and then I kind of had some life things that happened and just it kind of fell behind me. And then in meeting Mark and kind of moving forward, um, I think just our everyday lives, we started to realize that this was important to us. Just, at, just you know, opening a bottle, drinking a bottle. Once he came to Pinot Camp and, came, and he was just so excited about, 
about it. And I think that's when it really kind of started being like, we should probably explore this a little more. Like real, like we had talked about it, but I think we really, yeah, you know I, what I mean. Like really you know, started to explore it after you had been here. I feel, I feel and like been to a certain extent, it it was even before that. Um, we had gotten into a place before we left Florida where we were involved in tasting groups on yeah a couple days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and in Colorado, I mean, it was all the time. Wake up, go to a tasting group, go to work. 8 a.m. Yeah. You know, I, so I think it, it just, it somewhat naturally became us almost yeah. at that point of our first date. And what are you going to, what are we going to drink and what are we going to make for dinner? Right. And the, the logical, the steps that have happened have almost just naturally happened. We, yeah. we said, let's take a road trip to Colorado. We did that. And then fell into great wine programs there, both mm -hmm. of us. I mean, she was at the Little Mel there working for, I mean, some of the best yeah. master sommeliers in the world, and mm -hmm. I had just an incredible wine program. Mm -hmm. And then just the next step was, okay, how do we learn about production? Okay, well, right. we need to move closer to production. Yeah. Once we started learning about production, it was like, okay, what's the next step? It's like, okay, let's we make, make wine. wine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and, you know, for us, it was, okay, we need to still be able to live the life that we want to live and be able to learn how to make wine. And it was easy, easier for us to say, okay, let's invest and make our own wine and help and have someone help us learn that process mm -hmm. than to say, hey, I'm going to go be a cellar master. And it, it just, it wasn't for where we were in life and stepping into the process it made more sense yeah yeah but i, th I mean i do think that there was the, like an aha moment where we when you came back from pinot camp and you talked about what you learned here that we were like okay we can really we can do this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that that you know sure kind of happened in a matter of a few months where then he was like i think i want to go work harvest and so he did <laughs> And it's really my favorite part of the year, so. So came out and worked harvest and with Drew Voigt and um, Jen stayed in Colorado and then at the end I came back to Colorado and I said, you know, let's go. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so it was January of 15. Of 15. Yep. I guess we've been here five, five years. years this month. Yep, five years this month. Yeah. Yeah. And so then I just started, I mean, from there, you know, I worked at the Allison and met a lot of great people and started to do things for friends, dig ditches around vines, harvest, mm -hmm. um, just as a learning, you know, kind of thing. and. Now every year I'm like I can't wait to get out in the vineyard. I can't wait to get. I can't wait for harvest to come. I, it's exciting to me. I love it. You know, um, and I think we're fortunate that we have a. a there's a core group of. Co there's a community here mm -hmm. of people that are willing to, you know, help you and you can ask questions to and and it's very. They're open mm -hmm. with the answers to those questions. It's not like a big secret. I'm not going to tell it. You know, <laughs> at least in what I've experienced. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and so really, so we, I mean, it, it's just always been a natural process. It's always mm -hmm. from day one, the first day that we met, wine was kind of ingrained into our relationship in, mm -hmm. in some fashion. Mm -hmm. And then once we got here, you know, we, I started, I would leave and go drive out to Walla Walla and kind of just drive through vineyards, knocking on doors, trying to find um, contracts. You know, we had we had fallen in love with Walla Walla Syrah and um, the wines that we connected the most with we were finding were all from the south side of the border on the Oregon side and all came from a very distinct soil profile. And uh, the Rocks District at the time even more so than now had very little fruit available 
And so it really was just going out there repetitiously and putting our faces in front of people and knocking on doors and being in the right place when certain fruit contracts came available. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it, how it happened. Um, yeah. When Charles Smith sold out to Crimson, or I think Crimson or whichever group he sold to, some of the contracts in a vineyard that I had been trying to get into came available. And so we picked them up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and our first vintage is not from there. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Our first vintage is from a, di a whole different uh, but vineyard. A, a different yeah. vineyard, but the same, same soil, soil profile. Same soil profile. Um, but that, I think that that really was a driving force. We wanted to make these wines that we had connected with mm -hmm. that were very different than any other Syrah coming out of Washington, California, Oregon. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we felt like Oregon Syrah had a voice that wasn't being that wasn't being heard not not only was it not being heard it was almost being heard in a different tone mm -hmm. because people were labeling these wines as walla walla wines and there was no recognition of the fact that this was a, a very specific area on, mm -hmm. on the Oregon side of the mm -hmm. border mm -hmm. and that's something that we wanted to connect with and highlight mm -hmm. Tell me about OPC and, and your first harvest with Drew and, and what it was, what, what, what was the addiction? What was, what was it that made you like want to leave, come back, or st come here, stay here, do that? Yeah. Um, OPC specifically, uh, the community of producers and the, um, you know, you sit down in the, the auditorium at the airport or at uh, the museum, mm -hmm. and the first thing you, you see is the Jimmy Brooks story. Mm -hmm. And it's like everything that you just see is just so community-based, and um, it was, you know, it was, it was the entire environment of the producers of essentially just being immersed in the local culture. Um, and uh, the, the first harvest with Drew was nuts, nuts. I mean, there was just three of us, Drew, Andrew Bandy Smith and myself, and uh, I think we crushed a hundred and pretty close to 170 tons. And at the same time, there was five other wineries in the space mm -hmm. trying to do their own production. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah Jorgensen, uh, Matt from Wild Air, uh, Adam, and Adam Smith. And it hey. was just this wild environment. Yeah. I mean, it was like, it was like just all of these young winemakers that were extremely focused on what they were doing and helping each other and um, I mean, it was the the addiction is that you show up at 7:45 in the morning and you have no idea what time you're going home, and <laughs> you're there until one o'clock in the morning, you know. Um, and for me, who was coming from a service environment, and before that, a nine-to-five office gig in the real estate world, and I never, never really done work like that before. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, and Jen, you mentioned the the harvest being your favorite time as well. Why? Uh, I love being in the vineyard. I love picking. Mm -hmm. I love I love everything about it. I love I mean as as silly as it might sound, the satisfaction of getting fruit from one place to the bottle is it's an artistic thing and you know my whole life has had you know I've always been an artistic person mm -hmm. I did art when I was really young and I've always been that way mm -hmm. and I think that kind of fills the void for me mm -hmm. that fills that that artistic creative component that I need in my life mm -hmm. um, and so I just it's it's when I look back on our first vintage which was 17 and I remember 
it was crazy. It was crazy because we, we were just like, okay, well, how are we going to do this and how are we going to do that? And we got to get the fruit from here to there. And okay, it's, you know, it was just crazy. And to see it now from that moment, it's like such a rewarding thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, and I think part of the addiction too was that not knowing. Yeah. You know, we, I had, we were trying, to, we, I basically had locked in Fruit in the Rocks district for the 17 vintage, but the winter was really harsh out there and there was almost 50% crop loss through all of the vineyards that I was working on contracts with and no one they didn't know us. Did, no, they wouldn't. They didn't know us, and they wouldn't guarantee us fruit until far too late in the year. And so, we had to essentially. We had already bought barrels. We had made a deal with Evan Martin to work with him up in his space, and um, we just kind of had to punt. And so, around June, and I started pulling out soil maps and looking for this particular soil series, the free water loam series, and where else I might be able to find fruit. And, um, you know, we, we made it, made a deal with a guy and we had, you know, we show up there and they were so they kind. Were, they're so kind to us. They're like, you're stay the night, stay the night in our house. <laughs> we had and, dinner. We had, lo I mean, you know, you know, and, um, waking up at you know sunlight and picking this five acre vineyard on the ridge of the columbia um with these people that had homesteaded the property um you know it, it was just a surreal experience mm -hmm. and then you know there nothing they had homesteaded this property nothing had ever been planted on it uh, until he retired from physical therapy and found that this would be a great place to plant syrah and grenache and so, you know, and this is, it was just um, everything about it. I, yeah. had, I have never been an artistic person. I've been, you know, but everything about it in the process of meeting this family, standing on the crush pad and making, you know, we made a decision to pick this fruit. And this vineyard was so remote that they had to hire a crew off of Red Mountain. And the, the vineyard manager that came down to do the pick is like, in Washington Wine Press, he's the vineyard manager of the year, and he looked at me and he's like, I've never seen anybody pick Syrah this early. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> first vintage, we were like, like, great, awesome. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, I know what we're trying to achieve in the bottle, and it's definitely not what's typical from out here, and so, good. Hopefully we made the right decision. <laughs> yeah. And um, so everything about that, I think, makes you want to do it again. Yeah. Right. It's addictive. You get an entire year to think about something you did once. once. And you get an entire career to think about something that you maybe get to do 25 times. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how do you make it better every time? Every time. And how do you change it? How does it evolve? Yeah. And for us, it was, we, we talked about it from the beginning. It was, how do you make the most honest wines every year? Mm -hmm. So in 17, yeah, we wanted to make wine from River Rock Vineyard. Unfortunately, that wasn't. It wasn't our lot, and mm -hmm. so we we did, you know. And uh, but every year, I feel like has directed us more into the into place. that into the place. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me about the the process of starting your own brand, of choosing choosing a name, and taking care of all of the branding and the what, what, what new skills did you have to learn? What did you have to kind of figure out uh, <laughs> to to make that? I work? will say this in one sentence. This is the reason that people hire marketing teams. <laughs> because it was probably the it was it's been a, it's been a challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it took us how long to design our labels? I, I don't mean, know how we came up with the name. <laughs> I, 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 like, like I, know. I know the origins of the name, and I know why we would have why we started talking about it. I have no idea. <laughs> no of, recollection. I have no, no idea of any other name that we considered with this name. You know what? I don't either. Like any other name we considered? <laughs> no, I no. know we did. But we, but, but we definitely that. knew that we wanted. We looked up. We knew we wanted a French name. 
No, and we wanted it to revolve around, around the, the soil, soil profile. Yep, we wanted it to revolve around the soil profile, and I think we, I, I think I don't even know. I think we did the ro uh, rocks, like at, or stones in French, rocks in French, like all different little little things that represented that soil, and then we found this, and we were like, that's it. And we had a whole different idea of the labeling. I mean, the labeling we thought we would go with. I spent time looking through archives, archives at like uh, the historic society in Walla Walla for old flood pictures, and and uh, we had all of our branding like heading towards these old vintage flood photographs. And one morning, <laughs> I feel this. I me in bed, and she looks at me. And she's like, "I don't know how to tell you this. I hate our label." <laughs> That is a true story. And I was like, great. <laughs> we uh, were bottling our wine six weeks from now or two months from now. So. Start over. Start over. And we started over. And we just took the name and started playing with it on paper. And then. Yeah. We really, from the, the name and the branding and the label. I don't, we, we generally had most of the input on it. Uh, we started working with a label designer and we had, we sent him essentially this and this and it locked in. We knew the colors that we wanted. We always knew the colors. That's yeah. one, one thing we did know. <laughs> but I, the the changing from the photographs to the name and when it happened created a little heartbreak <laughs> or heartache pardon yeah. me, with uh, bottling the first vintage. <laughs> we, our labels weren't done when we went to bottle and so we had to wait six months to... Yeah, like not even close to done. But lessons learned. So it all worked out. It's fine. <laughs> uh, can, it can never be easy. It's no, <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy. And I mean, trademarking the name was another thing that we kind of ran we, into. We were lucky again that a there's lucky. a community of people to say, "Hey, I did this wrong. Do this mm -hmm. now." Mm -hmm. And so um, we were fortunate. And I guess this kind of ties back into like, how did we get this wine to bottle? But um, we were fortunate that Evan Martin could look at us and say, hey, I just had to completely change my brand name and I had to bail out of a, a, a lawsuit and just give it up. Mm -hmm. And so this is the process that you need to go through immediately to trademark your name. And um, that was really helpful for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but. Um, you know, along the way, you still find you can do everything right and still find that someone's already using the name without the proper trademark. Mm -hmm. Yep, which happened. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily in this context, but they were using the name as uh, on, on a specific varietal. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we reached out to them and they were like, we're cool. And we're like, great, because we've just now we've are, this is already our second branding and we didn't want to have to change the name now. Mm -hmm. oh, we had already printed. We had already printed the labels. We had already like started everything. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had gone through the trademarking process properly. It was yeah, just, they didn't, mm -hmm. and they were just went through and made labels and mm -hmm. yeah. got them approved. So um, the process, I you know, everything we've done, we've kind of like just put a flag in the ground and said, all right, we're going to go from here and do this. But it's it's been a huge learning process. The whole of the whole process of creating the business and um, creating the name, uh, hiring vendors for the bottles, the labels, uh, for us, it was all new. Every bit of it. What about the making of the wine? How did how how is that? What has that process been like? So um, I was lucky enough to be invited to a tasting group uh, when we were planning out our branding and, and label. 
uh, by Anthony King. Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony uh, invited me to his house one night. We were in the stage of we're gonna make this wine. This is the bridal that we want to make. This is what we want to start with. Where are we gonna do that? And so I got. I was at this tasting group next to Evan Martin, and um, I really loved the way that he thought of and talked about wine. I thought he was one of the most um, honest uh, and uh, really kind of thoughtful mm -hmm. winemakers that I had spoken with. And so I came home and we talked about it and then I said, why don't we reach out to Evan and see if we connect? And um, we did, we sat mm -hmm. down at lunch and I, I mean, I think I speak for both of us. We, really enjoyed the process mm -hmm. of talking to him and talking about what we were looking to do. And he showed an interest in not just making this wine with us or, or making, making this the wine, wine for, for us. He wanted to incorporate us into the process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which he's been great about. And um, so that the, the process really has gone from us finding the fruit source, us going out sampling, trying to decide when zone in on a picking date, and then bringing the fruit back, and then showing off at Evan's door and saying, "Let's make wine." Let's make wine. And First year we were there for many many hours. <laughs> yeah, he was in a, good. Evan's it was he was in a new space. Mm -hmm. um, he had just built out his his space, and so he was. I think still like, you know, space wise, you know, space management. We were the first and we were the first the fruit in the in cellar. In the new cellar in seventeen, which I think helped him kind of game plan yeah, what game he plan. was doing. Yeah. But for us it was I mean, we went through such a detailed production process in seventeen. I mean, we wanted to make wines uh similar to those in the Northern Rhone, and that we wanted them to be co-fermented Syrah and Viognier at a specific percentage. And so um, we also wanted to get a baseline of what the fruit would do for us. And so we took all of the fruit, brought it in house, and then separated it. <laughs> we weighed it all and made four separate fermentations from a uh, hundred percent destem to a hundred percent whole cluster that one of which we treated like a carbonic maceration mm -hmm. and every one of them was broken down by weight for 90 percent Syrah and 10 percent <laughs> Viognier. Yep, yeah, we did that. And, uh, I mean it took us basically an entire day to process five tons of fruit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, that production process of co-fermenting the Syrah and Viognier has stayed with us and that is something that we plan to carry on mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. all of our red production yeah so tell me about the chardonnay that's the, the other part of this chardonnay i feel like well for, i mean it's what we drink the most of i think yeah. yeah i mean chardonnay is definitely i mean we've had some i think white burgundy we started with white burgundy and and kind of have just Evolve from there, where we are just we're just in love with Chardonnay. So, this kind of connecting the roots of the project, right? Why are we in Oregon? What do we love? Right. We love Oregon, Oregon Chardonnay, Chardonnay, and we love or Oregon Syrah, and we think that there are voices for both of these varietals that haven't been fully realized, or that or that our voice our for voice. these varietals has something to say. Mm -hmm. And um, we identified some. Chardonnays that came from specific vineyards that we loved, uh, that we continually connected with and would go back to. And so we reached out to them to see if we could get some fruit. Mm -hmm. And Mo Ayu was, I mean, he's just been great, great to us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since, since we moved here. Since really, we moved here. Since even before yeah. Jen moved here, yeah. Mo and I became friends. And I love. The Chardonnay that comes off of this site, mm -hmm. and so I said, "Mo, can I have a ton of Chardonnay?" He's like, no, no, <laughs> can't do it. Yep. He's like, I, "It's it's more valuable to, valuable to me in the bottle." Next year, Mo, can I have some Chardonnay? How much do you want? A ton. I can't give you a ton. 
okay, you can have a ton <laughs> three days before harvest. Can you take just a half ton? <laughs> All right, I'll give you the ton. And so, um, you know, we there's there's something very specific about Chardonnay from uh, volcanic soils here, and something mm -hmm. very specific about it from uh, marine sedimentary soils. Mm -hmm. And so we. We're fortunate to get some fruit from Tristatum's Coast Range as well, uh, from uh, the uh, marine sedimentary side, and it it was a great way for us to identify a varietal that we love mm -hmm. and be able to start playing with it and understand what are the things that we like about it and how do we get that into a bottle. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did. Yeah. Um, we're kind of over the moon about the way the first Chardonnay came out. We're gonna um, probably release it uh, in February or March. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I, we're probably, we're really probably, excited. Yeah, it's really, really excited, excited about it. And, yeah. and that's, um, I think, uh, is as important to us as the mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. this year, so um, we made essentially two barrel, two and a half barrels, both in 17 and 18, and then this year, uh, pardon me, 18 and 19, and then this year, uh, the goal is to uh, expand that production. Yeah. Adding a couple of vineyard sources in. Mm -hmm. It's the goal. We'll see. see. So you started, you started small and you started with, without Pinot. I'm, I'm curious about finding a market and finding, uh, finding people to buy your wine and, and what the feedback has been so far. Yeah. Um, the feedback's been great. Yeah. The um, starting small is hard because you are small. It's great, mm -hmm. but hard. Yep. Um, we've been fortunate uh, that we have uh, some great relationships from working in the hospitality industry and restaurant industry that have carried with us from the East Coast mm -hmm. to Colorado to here, mm -hmm. which has helped us have a small base of um, customers mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, being small has made it very difficult even with restaurants that want our wine in Florida and Colorado to be able to get distribution to be able to get it to those people. Yeah, so that's our that's our, probably our biggest challenge, challenge right, right now right. is trying to get, you know, we have restaurants that want to pour our wine and we got to get it there mm -hmm. and distributors are um, have been a challenge so far. There's only so, right, our, as you start to look at the distribution business, right, certain brands almost slot themselves. Right, and our brand makes the most sense for a small boutique distributor. Mm -hmm. And there's only so much room in their book for an Oregon Syrah. And there are, right, there's, you know, I, I thought I had a, a, a done deal just for an example. And he's like, you know, I'm going to pick up this brand, which is an absolute, it's one of brand. our icon hey. brands, one yeah. of our, you know, um, and it's like, yeah. You know, we've. I can't we, argue you, with you. You and I have been friends for 15 years. Like we've done business together. I, I understand why you're going that mm -hmm, route. So mm -hmm. that makes it a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, we have managed to to secure great restaurant placements throughout Portland and a few in the Valley, and so that has helped build that brand. Here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and so we have some placements in Bend too. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, but it's it's not easy. And so for us, it, the goal is trying to figure out how the next step is to have a retail presence. Mm -hmm. And so, and that kind of ties into what we're trying to do on Baker Street downtown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Tell me more about that. Sure. I, that that's new to me. That's so new, yeah. Baker Street downtown. Yeah, so the, the house that we bought on Baker is zoned commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where our winery license is, mm -hmm. um, which is not a production license. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the goal with that property is to turn it into a vacation rental tasting room. Uh, there's, It's got a great piece of property out back that we can do uh, dinners and things of that mm -hmm. nature. And so that will be the next step in the evolution. Yeah. 
Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, we still have some work to do on that. From that is then a vineyard. Then yeah, after that. Planted to Syrah Chardonnay. Yeah. We got a lot of goals. We do. Yeah, we do. We do. As you, you have such a, a kind of a national knowledge of wine and, and you obviously have national connections in wine. As you go forward, are you thinking that most of your wine will be sold out of state or are you focusing on in state as well or are you just sort of mm. wherever it lands? Yeah, I mean, I think the goal is that, the goal for us is that 80% of it will go to people on our yeah. mailing list Direct or consumer. out of uh, out of a, a retail setting. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 80% um, would be fantastic. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that um, until we, so in 2019, we will have two Syrahs that we'll make and a Chardonnay. It gives us a little bit more of a portfolio to be able to, again, try and get a distributor's eye and get more mm -hmm. national focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I, I think I see that, the national impact as uh, an evolution. Yeah, it's gonna, hap it's gonna have to happen, but yeah, yeah it's just, we need more SKUs for that. Yeah. You come from, coming from the background you come from, coming from the SOM background and, the, and the, the, the sales background, I'm curious what's different about having your own brand? Uh, what do you know from having sold other people's brands that you are using now and, and how difficult is it now that it's your, not your name on the label, but your name on the label? Yeah, um, I think that you take the criticism more personal now. Um, if, you know, you open a bottle of wine and serve somebody a bottle of wine and they're like, ah, I really don't like it. You don't really think much of it. Mm -hmm. But when you're pouring your wine and somebody's like, oh, mm, no, it's not my jam. That's the, that's the fear is that someone's gonna say they don't like it. I don't think we've had that experience yet. But people could just be, you know, you don't know what people's real thoughts well, are. Right? I think it's very important messaging uh, and understanding how to um, tell a story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I definitely have taken out of the last couple of years yeah. of working at the Painted Lady where we are pouring seven different wine pairings during someone's two and a half hour experience is that how to break down the messaging into 30 seconds 30 to yeah. 60 to, to 90 seconds yeah. and trying to create a focus focus story yeah mm -hmm. well I think story is always important right yeah. relationship people have a relationship with wine people always buy this wine because they had it on their honeymoon or they always buy this wine because you know, they had this, it was the last wine they drank with their mom or, you know, whatever, it, whatever their story is with that wine. And I think for us, if we can have those stories, then it will have lifelong consumers, right? Because mm -hmm. they'll have that connection, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, somebody that we met, you know, 20 years ago or somebody we've just met. Who are the people that, you know, the people that are most, notable to my, to my customers that are in from out of town, right? Mm -hmm. The people that I hear make the longest lasting relationships. Jay McDonald, mm -hmm. he doesn't have a vineyard, he doesn't have this big mm -hmm. production space, right? But you talk to the people that have spent time with Jay mm -hmm. and they're like, lasting relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Brian and Claire, yeah, now they're moving into their own dedicated mm -hmm. space. They don't have a vineyard, right? But you walk up and it's a, you see the goats, you see the pigs. Yeah. And it's like this. It's the. It's a connection. It's the ultimate organ experience. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so, I think that telling the story is something that we've taken away is yeah really mm -hmm. important. Yeah, because those are all the places that we take guests to. Mm -hmm. Like when we have friends in town, we take people to places where they're going to have a connection and a story mm -hmm. and where they're going to feel like, wow, I can't, I can't imagine not drinking this wine. Mm -hmm. uh, and our hope is that we're, we are those people, hopefully. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll get there. You know, it's a long trail though. It's a long trail. Mm -hmm. Not easy. You talked a bit about you know, you, at, me at the Allison and, and the Painted Lady and some of the other, the other jobs you've had while creating your brand. Uh, tell me, you're both 
uh, in the midst of changes now. So tell me a little bit about some, <laughs> some of the some of the things you have done in Oregon, uh, wine related, and of course, and where you're where you're just getting started now. Go ahead. No, yeah, I mean, I think both of us have been all over. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, been at the Painted Lady from 2015 until. Uh, the end of the year last month yeah, yeah. Um, and really I just kind of made a decision in July that it it was time to kind of move in a different direction and so gave them notice in July that I'd be leaving at Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and um, have an opportunity now to uh, go to the Waverly Country Club and create uh, essentially an affinity wine club from the ground up and um, work with a seller that's 5,000 bottles and four different rooms and um, it's just it, it it's exciting for me for um, to, to really be able to hone in on mm -hmm. working with this program yeah yeah um, yeah I was at the Allison for three years and um, after that I worked at Zenith down in Eola Amity mm -hmm. and kind of did wine and hospitality program there and um, which was a great learning experience for me and um, but I knew I didn't want to do another year of weddings um, so I knew that I was like yeah Jen's pretty low-key but she's worked in like the greatest restaurant wine programs in this country I mean, I'm very fortunate I'm very fortunate in the places that I worked in my life and the people that I've I met had the opportunity to experience great wine yeah and yeah I mean yeah yeah, um, I've worked with some of the best master psalms, and and it's just been it's been a great journey so far, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, I knew I didn't want to work. Uh, I, I knew I didn't want to do weddings, so I um, left there just a few month, uh, just a month ago, I guess. Yeah, end of the, end of the year. Um, it was our first New Year's together in twelve years because we always worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was a very strange kind of event. <laughs> we, really, we really didn't know what to do or how to act. We're like, oh, happy new year, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and um, so now I'm in a tasting room right now, um, which has been, uh, I've been there about three weeks, so it's been a fun, a fun uh, learning experience there as well. That's so. That's a lot of our, you know, you talked before about like, we're still on that consumer side. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's this weird blend I think yeah. of you know we're still on the consumer side we have um, I think it really it helps us at least talk about brevity but like understand where it realistically where the where our place is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, understand how to sell it mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. that's been the whole the biggest challenge Challenge. You have this. You have this experience, like you say, with some some pretty awesome places, <laughs> awesome wine lists, and, and some. How does the Oregon wine scene compare to other places you've been? Hmm. You know, I, I think it's interesting. Yeah. The the last year has seen you know so much pullback in the wine market internationally, and Oregon is really the only one of the only markets in the world that That's is still expanding growing. Yeah. And has a higher than average bottle yeah. cost. Mm -hmm. Um. I, there's the, the trajectory here is just there's I think it, it goes to the whole it goes to the whole thing of what you like about Pinot Camp and what brings you out here right the Oregon Trail I, the, there's so much development here and um, willingness to to push this industry in every different direction. I think. I think we're fortunate here that I think a lot of people are still experimenting and people are still growing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people are wanting to try new things. Um, I think we're also very fortunate that a lot of the guests that are coming here, it's their first time here. Mm -hmm. So they're just getting, they're like, oh, I, I, I've never had these wines before. This is amazing. And so they want to experience it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that those are all great things that are happening right now. Um, I think we've also been lucky to have some bigger outside forces coming in to help push people for sure to get better. 
uh, I think, you know, there's the investment that's been made here over the last, since 2013 by the big companies has really helped push everyone to be on top of their game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And I think that, so I think there was almost like this period of experimentation here that was far more advanced and going much more quickly in the last five years than maybe a lot of other places. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone's like stuck in their same old, same old. You know, I think everybody's, you know, we've had some different, like last year, you know, we've heard about a lot of challenges in different vineyards and different places and everybody's like, okay, but I still made wine. Mm -hmm. Like, that's all good, you know. Um, but all those challenges, even though, you know, for a few years prior to that, it was all, everything's great and everything's easy or easier. Um, so I think there's a lot, there's, you know, I think the, some of those bigger companies coming in have also given Oregon international recognition mm -hmm. that we never would have gotten otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you have, if you're making 5,000 cases of wine, you're, how are you going to, you know, sales things in China and, you know, all these things in all these parts of the world where, you know, you probably don't have much wine to send over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's helping, you know, drive some traffic. Um, with international consumers and even national consumers, you know, coming from the East Coast or Texas or they've never been here before. Mm -hmm. I think in the past five years since we've been here, I'm starting to see more of those, of those people coming as a first time traveler. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, it's my first time in the Valley. Where should I go? Mm -hmm. What should I drink? And then once they see that, you know, oh, well, I can, I can get this wine where I live, but I can't get any of this. And I was like, well, that's because there's a thousand cases made. It's not going, it's not going to you. Mm -hmm. You have to buy it here. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh. So I think that, that there's, you know, there's a, it, that's a nice quality to have for the consumer, mm -hmm. where they can come here and get these special wines that they can't. I don't think Oregon's ever going to be California. You know, no. Talking about where it's placed in the world or where it's going to be. No. Um, but. I don't think it ever wants to be or needs to be. No. Um, I do think that there's so many growing areas and so many microclimates in distinct growing areas here uh -huh. that it almost may be a challenge to create an identity outside of the Willamette Valley for mm -hmm. Oregon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Everyone knows Burgundy. They know Pinot Noir and they know Chardonnay and they know they can understand when they look at the climates of the Willamette Valley and Burgundy, why you can do this here. Mm -hmm. But when you start to say, oh, the Applegate Valley is great because you can grow Syrah there, you can grow Cabernet there, you can grow Pinot Noir there, you can grow 60 different varietals, it makes it very hard to take the brand international. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think that the Willamette Valley will always be what Oregon is identified as. Mm -hmm. uh, do I hope that we can carve out this niche in Northeastern Oregon for Syrah? Yes, because I truly believe that it is one of the five best places in the world to grow the varietal mm -hmm. um, distinctly. Mm -hmm. And so do I think that, do I hope that we can create that niche? I think it's happening. I mean, yeah, I think for sure. that Walla Walla Syrah and Rocks District Syrah specifically has now been on the cover of Wine Spectator three times mm -hmm. in the last two years. Mm -hmm. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. We've never done anything to, to try and be well known for. You know, yeah. I mean, there's never, there's never been a thought. There's like, never been one thought in our heads like, oh, like we're, we're going to do this yeah. to try and be on the front wave of getting rich in Oregon right. Syrah. Right. right, that's not our thoughts at all. That's not our thoughts. Pr probably right. for the best. Right, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. But um, we do do it because we think that we have a distinct voice of something that we want to make <laughs> and where that ends up in the world, who knows? Yeah, who knows? Yeah, I mean, all we can hope for is that we sell wine, right? <laughs> we can live and you know live the life that we want to lead which is a pretty simple life we want to be able to you know travel a little bit eat good drink good and you know enjoy the things that we enjoy um yeah this is not definitely not uh we're doing it for the money uh endeavor it is not 
We're doing it to spend money. <laughs> Hemorrhage money. Yeah. yeah. As is everyone is, right? As is everyone. You know, it's always funny to me when people come here and they're like, oh, I want to buy a vineyard. And I'm like, you want to be a farmer? They're like, no, I want to buy a vineyard. I'm like, so you want to be a farmer? Yeah, okay. Do you want to lose a lot of money? And, you know, and they're like, yeah, I'm like, okay. And then, then it's good for you. It's, it's funny to have to talk to consumers, you know, they have this romantic illusion of what winemaking is and what a vineyard looks like. They don't understand all the, you know, <laughs> bugs and mud boots and everything. Stuff. Everything before it's in the glass. Yeah. So they, don't, yeah. they don't get. They don't get. So, yeah, still a fun conversation to have. So you, you talked a bit about your your own future plans with uh, the space here and, uh, and hopefully a vineyard down the way and a uh, retail. Uh, tell me, uh, are, beyond Syrah and Chardonnay, is there something else you want to do in the future, or is, is this is this kind of where you want to be? Uh, this is where we want to be. Yeah. I mean, we don't have plans of having a second label that is experimenting in different yeah. clones of something. <laughs> Um, these are the wines that we are focused on making, whether mm -hmm. or not we expand the footprint of where we make Syrah yeah. from, I think that that's, that's more likely that's to more happen. Likely mm -hmm. that you'll see us sourcing Willamette Valley Syrah, but as far as, you know, we, two, two years in a row, we've got people trying, you know, here, take this ton and a half of Cabernet. We're like, make it, put it in a bottle, and then pay me. And last year it was Pinot Noir, and we're just, we're just focused. This yeah. is, these are the wines that we wanted to make, yeah. and I think it's important to go back to that, having understanding your place in the market in the world that we don't dilute the brand. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think you know you can get caught up in in just making wine and not having a vision. Like if somebody's giving you fruit, and you're and it's not something you typically are doing. Um, you can get caught up in that moment of being like, oh, but it's free fruit, and why not? Um, and I, I hope that we never get to that point. So far, we haven't gotten to that point um, where, where, where we want to take other varietals that aren't our passion. Mm -hmm. um, I think Syrah's our passion. So, you know, like Mark said, if, if we, you know, do different vineyards or different locations for Syrah, I think that's definitely more likely to happen than than for us to, you know, start making some other varietals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You talked a little bit about uh, Oregon wine, where it is now. What is it going to look like in 2030? What's the What's the Oregon wine industry going to look like in a mm -hmm. decade? I, you know, I feel pretty strongly that you're going to uh, see the tourism here really over the next 10 years solidify. Mm -hmm. And I think that that will push even further development, which we've, we've seen the expansion of the sub-AVAs. Um, but I feel like you're gonna see Salem become more of a, a, a regional center mm -hmm. for this area specifically. Um, I think it's, you know, but I think you're still always going to look at Oregon as place where you can come see cows and goats and sheep. Yeah. I, 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 I do. I, I, I'll tell you, no, I, I know it sounds funny, but you know, when you talk to customers that walk away from some of the experiences, they're, they're out here, they're not going to California, they're not going to Sonoma, they're coming here and I'm going to use Big Table Farm again as an example of like, this is what they expect to see when they come to Oregon. So many of these people from New York and Texas and that, that we have taken care of are like, Oregon's the new frontier. They've never been they, to the Pacific Northwest. They don't before. understand it, yeah. And they expect to come out here and they walk away from, like, they, they expect this farm, a, 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 a farming experience or something along those lines. Yeah, but I mean, we still have some fancy tasting rooms and things that are in the Absolutely. valley that people gravitate towards as well. Um, but you're still, still getting a personalized experience. You know, it's not so much of that, of that uh, I use this kind of loosely, 
that used car salesman experience where you're just going, here's some, you know, here's some, here's some, here's some, but not explaining the wine. Like, no matter where people are going in the valley, they're getting an experience most of the time of, do you want to talk about wine? Cool, let's talk about wine. Mm -hmm. You want to know how it was made? Because generally, consumers don't know how wine is made. Mm -hmm. They just think it, you pick the grapes and you know, it ends up in a bottle. I mean, how many times have you been asked, when do you add the strawberries or when do you add the cherries? It happens. <laughs> people don't know. So I think people are getting an education here. I think it's great when, when you know, no matter which tasting room you go to, we're not so busy that you can't have a one-on-one -on -one experience with a guest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that again goes back to those consumers having a memory of what they learned in that tasting room or with that winemaker or with that salesperson, that experience, and then they become these lifelong purchasers of this wine. Yeah. And I think that'll, that falls into a lot of that, you know, where is Oregon wine gonna be? I, again, yeah. like I- It's I hard to say. Think, well, I just, it's always going to be second to California. It's just, it is, I think, in the history of this country that it's going to be that way. Uh, there's so many factors that drive that. But I think Oregon has this place in the market that it's a trailblazer. Like, you're, you're going to come here and see more innovation. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, that's a, what, what an excellent question to end on. <clears throat> What's the secret to a successful marriage in the Oregon wine industry? <laughs> when you find out, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I think for us, anyway. Is it, is it different than any other? I, yeah. I mean, I think what it takes to have a successful marriage is pretty consistent, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's the oil yeah. wine industry. It doesn't matter if it's uh, if a, you're baker, both, yeah. a baker or whatever it yeah. is. I think, what, I, think the, the, I think working together on a project is definitely more challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for us, we both had to find our voice in what, we, what we're responsible for, mm -hmm. what components we're responsible for. Um, and I also think we both had to have a voice of okay, we're gonna stop this conversation right now because this is not going, <laughs> this is not going well. We'll come back to it later. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that has, that's definitely a challenge because you know, typically people come home from work and they just go, oh, my day sucked, blah, 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 blah. Or my day was great, blah, 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 blah. When you work with your partner on a project, it's definitely, but I wanna do it this way, but I wanna do it that way. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of compromise uh, you know, kind of goes back to that same thing. I hate our labels. <laughs> and he was like, great, awesome. Um, and that, you know, those were all things that happened. I think that the decisions that we make, we talk about. Um, we don't, that I'm aware of, make, he hasn't made any decisions without me. Um, you know, we try to make sure we're all on, all on the emails and you know, so we all know what's going on. I think communication is definitely an important component for us. Yeah, I mean, um, it's compromise. Yeah, yeah. Compromise is it's being able to look and say, okay, um, I need yeah. to step back and find yeah. middle ground. Yeah, I'll give you this and you give me that, you know? Um, and I think we both have really good ideas about what we wanna do. Um, we definitely don't have the same path to get to those ideas. So, talk it out. That's what makes it, that's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it interesting. <laughs> Every day. Every day. Every day. A life of interest. I don't think this project could have happened. I don't think, right, if I was with someone else, this project would have ever happened. I don't think if she was with someone else, this project ever would have happened. Right. I think this project is only the essentially the culmination of of what, us of what we think mm -hmm. it yeah. couldn't be done the same yeah it couldn't it would be very different if, yeah. it, if we were with different people well I, yeah yeah it I, might not have been done at all for sure. you know yeah. Um, yeah that's for sure it's awesome yeah, yeah. awesome 
So all the questions that we have, is there yeah. anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? Anything I didn't ask that I should have asked? I don't remember anything, so. <laughs> <laughs> huh? No, it was great. Thank you for having us. Thank you yeah. both yeah. for joining yeah. us, for sharing with us yeah. today. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And we'll go ahead and let's jump the hook.